It's a rainy morning in Okrid, where a blanket of mist obscures the legendary beauty of the lake. Lake Okrid is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and in better weather, the city is teeming with tourists who come to visit one of Europe's oldest and deepest lakes, and the many historic monuments and sacred sites on the shore. Despite the rain, we're staying a while here in the city of Okrid, located along the beautiful Lake Okrid. It's a popular tourist destination, especially among locals, but outside of that, few have heard of this place. And that's why I'm here to meet with a local expert who'll tell me why this was once one of the most influential and powerful cities of the Byzantine Empire. We agreed to meet at the picturesque St. John at Canio, a 13th century Macedonian Orthodox church dedicated to John the Evangelist, built on a cliff by the lake. Just look at that, what a view. Not even the rain can take the beauty away. Ah, Stavri, Hi. there you are. Stavri, my Albanian travel Hi. companion, introduces Hi. me to I one of like Okrit's foremost Byzantine art and church mine, historians. Clement, nice Hello, to meet Clement. you. Welcome to Okrit. So, Okrit had a very glorious history. Mm -hmm. it, it is a, a place with continuous uh, existence of civilization since since the 5th millennium BC. From the 6th century AD to the late 18th, the Archbishopric of Okrid was an ecclesiastical powerhouse, a third force after the popes of Rome and the patriarchs of the East. So we're standing here at one of the many Byzantine churches in the city. So the church and the city, uh, inseparable, right? Yes, uh, you know, once uh, Okrit had, according to the legend, 365 churches, wow. one church for each day of the year. <laughs> At the moment, there are around 47 active churches within the old part on the hill. Like most of the Balkans, Macedonia was absorbed into the growing Muslim Ottoman Empire, and some of the Christian churches like St. Sophia were converted into mosques. But because the Ottomans hardly altered the structures and merely covered some frescoes with a thin layer of paint, restoring churches after the Turks withdrew from the area was never too difficult. The 13th century church of Mary Peribleptos contains one of Okrid's most magnificent and well preserved frescoes part of the so-called Paleologus Renaissance, the Byzantine equivalent of the Medicis of Florence. From the courtyard of the church, you can see the medieval castle walls of Okrit, a flag of the now independent country, the symbol of Macedonia, with its complex identity intertwined with Bulgarian, Ottoman, Albanian, Serb and Greek. How do you feel and how do Macedonians feel about this kind of tug of war in the world community about who deserves to be called Macedonia? You know, our ancestors, my, my forefathers, they, they declared themselves Macedonians. It's uh, outrageous someone to change your name. We will never be pushed mm -hmm. by any kind of pressure mm -hmm. to do that, to, to step back because the truth is that we are Macedonians and we are living in the country which is called Republic of Macedonia. And that's Macedonia. why the Macedonian flag flies yes. proudly over this land. Yes, yeah, symbolizing the sun and the background, the red color, which is the blood that was shed for us to live a free life. The debate over the true Macedonia reflects a contentious and often violent narrative of the Balkans, where a history of shifting borders and forced migrations has fueled ethnic tensions and full-scale wars as recent as the 1980s. Though tensions rise every now and then, borders have never been as open and foreigners as welcome as they are today. We're driving along the route of the ancient Roman Via Ignatia into what was from the 1950s until the 80s the most reclusive and isolated state in Europe, Albania. These bunkers, part of over 700,000 across the country, were built by the paranoid Stalinist regime of Enver Hoxha to defend Albania from the imaginary threat of enemies.
It's mid-afternoon by the time we reach the capital, Tirana. Albania is still among the poorest in Europe, but the capital, with its growing middle class, is a different story. After more than three decades of isolation, Tirana is making up for lost time with a building boom and an ambitious urban renewal program. Just like the weather we had all day, Tirana was once a dull, dark and grey city, especially during its darkest years of dictatorship. And just like the weather right now, all that is changing. This is a new face of Tirana, a new face of the city, lively and colourful. A good place to witness this transformation is at Paza Iri, the newly converted market square with its farmer's market modern cafes, art installations, and brightly colored facades painted in ethnic Albanian patterns. The capital is modernizing rapidly, but the past survives in the city. This is the oldest surviving building in Tirana. It's the main mosque. Albania is one of two Muslim-dominated countries we're visiting on this trip. But don't get the wrong idea, because after communism, Religion is expressed very differently here. Islam is as liberal as it gets here, and most don't mind tourists inside their mosques. Religion, like other basic rights, were banned during a 40-year communist regime, and though practiced again, the fervor is missing. Believe it or not, one of the most popular attractions for visitors in Tirana are these bunkers over here. There are over 750,000 of them all over the country and we saw some of these bunkers on the way to the city. You know, it's something most Albanians would rather forget about, but it's extremely popular with tourists. Bunk Art 2 is a museum dedicated to Albania's 40-year dictatorship and the struggle to resist it. It occupies a secret underground bunker complex built in case of nuclear attack. The chambers give you a glimpse of life under Big Brother, where basic rights were suppressed, citizens spied on, and everyone was a suspect. Though vestiges of the past remain, the new generation of Albanians and the young of the Balkans are reshaping their region and embracing change. I must say I'm really impressed with my journey through the Balkans so far, but even I have to admit, given all the negative stereotypes about the place, it must be a challenge to promote the Balkans to the rest of the world. Well, that's why we're here, to talk to the owner of one company that's promoting the place. Ghazi Hagja's travel company, Albanian Experience Landways, is one of the few local players with a global footprint. His business is booming, especially in Asia, thanks to travelers seeking the unique destinations and authentic experiences captured in his tours of the Balkans. It's like off the beaten path. Yeah. So when people come here, everything positive is a highlight. In a nutshell, these countries offer a combination of uh, great hospitality, a super food, mm -hmm. organic food and great landscapes, mm -hmm. um, a good hotel scene, and a lot of uh, history and UNESCO sites. So you have a lot of UNESCO sites dotted all over, and the very small areas of these countries makes it uh, very possible for people to travel many countries within a few days. But I think the highlight is, is the people itself. Welcome to its hospitality, history, and scenery that's captivating me. And to think this is just the start of the journey. And that's all for our first part of our series on the Balkans. Join us again next time as we drive up the Adriatic coast. I'm David Saldran. Thanks for watching.